Hello and welcome to another Cypher 2 tutorial. I'm very excited about this video because I get to show you the sequencer. If you had Cypher 1 or even Strobe 2, this is all going to be new to you because this sequencer is brand new. It's a very flexible sequencer and it's loads of fun. So without further ado, let's dive in. I've made a very basic patch with which to show off the sequencer. It's a very simple sawtooth bass and lead sound. There's nothing complicated about it. Uh, the only modulation I'm using is some velocity to open up the filter envelope. And that's so that we can hear what the sequence is doing when it uses velocity later on. So the sequence of pages accessed up here, we've got our three main pages, effects, synth and sequencer. Here it is in all its glory. It looks complicated, but it's quite simple. This top section here is the step sequencer. This is where we input our notes or values. Beneath that is a gate sequencer, which tells each step whether to trigger or not. Then we have three modulation sequencers down the side. These are all identical and can be assigned to just about anything. So one sequencer might be doing velocity duties, another sequencer might be controlling the gate length of each step, and another sequencer might be assigned to something within the synth sound itself, such as filter cutoff or one of the oscillator frequencies or anything that can be modulated. In the middle section here, we can see uh, the master section where we have control over tempo, step length, and a few other things that we'll come to in a moment. The matrix in the center here is a way to easily control various aspects of a sequence. For example, we can control velocity by assigning anything from transmod to this knob here. So the velocity of the sequence could be controlled by an LFO, or it can be controlled by one of the three sequencers by selecting them on these radio buttons here. Down at the bottom, we have some arpeggiator preferences. We're not really going to be looking at the arpeggiator today. That's kind of another mode of the sequencer. And then finally is the scale processor. This allows you to force the output of the note sequencer to a key and scale of your choosing. And there are actually eight keys and scales available and you can switch between them up here in the matrix with this knob here. And that allows you to do some clever tricks programming chord changes using transmod. So let's get stuck in. First of all, there's a few things we need to set in the master section. When you're building a sound from scratch, you'll see the master section as it is now. The first thing we need to do is change the sequence mode to step sequencer. And then we need to enable the input. So that basically switches a MIDI keyboard input so that the input goes to the step sequencer and not straight to the synthesizer. So now when I hit the key on my MIDI keyboard, I should be able to hear just a straight bunch of 16th notes. And that is of course because we haven't put any notes in. If we so wish, we can enable hold mode, which means that the sequence will keep on playing after I release a note. Or latch mode, which is kind of a drone mode, which means that the sequencer is always playing. 
trig mode here, which is on by default, just specifies whether an incoming MIDI note will reset the sequences to the beginning. If I switch it off, you'll see that that doesn't happen. Obviously, we have control over tempo. From 30 BPM to 240 BPM. And step length. Which is, of course, relative to the tempo. It's worth noting that when using Cypher 2 as a plug-in, this tempo will be taken from the host song. So let's work on our sequence here. We've got the main step sequencer up at the top and we can see it scrolling around. We can change the length here. Note that this is a transmodable destination so we can control the sequence length using any modulation source. Now earlier on I just drew in a bunch of notes and that's a perfectly valid way of coming up with a sequence. But the other thing we can do is enter record mode here. And this enables us to use the MIDI keyboard in order to input a bunch of notes. You'll notice, of course, that when I play different notes on my MIDI keyboard after I've recorded them, the sequence is transposed. Obviously, when you transpose a sequence musically, it won't necessarily stick to the key and scale that you played it in. That's where our scale processor comes in. If I choose a scale like the pentatonic minor, the note output of the sequencer will be forced into a C pentatonic minor scale. <laughs> Below the step sequencer, we have the gate sequencer. And here we can select which steps are triggered and which steps aren't. But there's also quite a few interesting other options. For example, if I set some of the steps to fill, these steps will only trigger when this variable parameter here goes above 50%. At the moment, it's at 28%. And you'll hear that those steps are not triggered. So that's a really interesting way of developing a sequence using some kind of MIDI controller or some sort of modulation source like an LFO. If, for example, I select this LFO up here, we can hear that our sequencer is getting quite complicated already. Another trigger option is probability. Probability uses the variable to set a percentage probability of that step triggering. So you can see there that those probability steps that I set sometimes trigger and they sometimes don't. And the percentage likelihood of them triggering is this variable amount. So if I was to bring that right down to zero, they would never trigger. If I put them at 100%, they will always trigger. Other options are Alt. Alt allows you to set certain steps to trigger on certain cycles. And again, it's down to this variation parameter. So if I set this at quite a low value, what we should get is an Alt that triggers on every second cycle. But if I increase that, it'll be every third cycle.
If I increase that all the way, it'll be once in every six cycles. The final two options are follow and not follow. This is quite simple. It just allows the step to follow exactly what the step before it did. So if I set the first one to Alt and the next three to follow, and let's reduce this down to four just so we can hear what's going on. So I've got an Alt, two follows and a not. The Alt is going to trigger once in every two cycles. And then the two steps after it are going to trigger exactly the same as the first one. They're just going to copy the state of the gate. The final one is going to do the opposite of the one before it because it's a not follow. So using all of these in combinations, we can come up with interesting variations on gate patterns. Let's uh, just put a few of these in randomly. So that's the gate sequencer. What other interesting things can we do with the matrix sequencer? Well, this is really where the mod sequences come in. So at the moment, I'm feeling like this step sequence is, it's a little dry. It could do with something interesting. Why don't we play with the duration of each note? Now I'm gonna assign the duration to step sequencer number one up here. So if I flatten that step sequencer, we should hear a lot of very short notes. What we've got now is we've got this sequencer controlling the length of each step. The keen-eyed amongst you will notice that this is a 16-step sequence, whereas this is an 8-step sequence. Let's have a few more of these on. Let's assign velocity to mod sequencer 2. Then let's do something interesting and use step sequencer 3 to assign step shift. Now step shift is a system where the playhead can basically shift about within this entire pattern. You'll see what I mean as soon as I press go. And you can see that mod sequencer 3 is making the playhead jump about. Now it would be really interesting if we changed mod sequencer 3's length to something other than 16. And why don't we change the other sequencer's lengths while we're at it? So it's very easy to come up with complex step sequences using combinations of sequences running at different lengths. Fine pitch here can be used to change the swing of a sequence. Let's just reset this and this, and I'll change this to a two-step sequence. And this is a timing change, so you'll notice as I move this second step that we get a kind of swing happening.
because this is step sequencer controlled, we can come up with very crazy patterns of swing. Standard swing though would just be a two-step sequence with the second step delayed slightly. The two that we haven't looked at yet are memory and scale. Scale should be fairly obvious. It selects one of the eight scale types down here. And memory allows us to change the note sequence up here. There are eight memories, so we can put a different sequence in each memory. And then switch between them. So as you can see, the step sequencer is incredibly powerful and flexible. It's really good fun building things up from scratch. One thing it's worth noting is that the step sequencers are also available up here in the transmod section. So you can use them to modulate effects, you can use them to modulate things in the synthesizer, or you can use them to modulate things in the sequencer. The last trick I want to show you is if you have a wonderful sequence and you fancy trying it out with a different sound, you can make use of the locks up here. So what I'm going to do is lock the sequencer. And what that means is that when I load a new preset from the browser over here, the sequencer will stay exactly as it is, which means that I can just load a sound. So let's have a look, for example, at other bass sounds. So that's it, the sequencer in Cypher 2. Join me soon for another tutorial.